um, our sponsors, the National Cartoonist Society Foundation and National Cartoonist Society, and Andrews McNeil Universal and Scripps. Now we're gonna jump into our first panel, the first official meeting of the Ernie Bushmiller Society. Okay. I'd, I'd like to introduce Dennis Kitchen. It's impossible to summarize Dennis's remarkable career in comics in a few minutes. He's a cartoonist, an author, a publisher, a curator, a, a historian, and a collector. A part of the underground comics movement in the 1960s and 70s, Dennis founded the Pioneer Comics Publishing House Kitchen Sink Press in 1969 and the comic book Legal Defense Fund in 1986. His comics have appeared in numerous anthologies, gallery exhibits, and books, such as the oddly compelling art of Dennis Kitchen. He's won countless awards for his work, including an Eisner, a Harvey, an Inkpot, and several Lifetime Achievement Awards. And he has been inducted into the Will Eisner Hall of Fame. Welcome, Dennis Kitchen. All right, come on, fellas. <laughs> Introduce uh, the panelists uh, from your left. We have uh, Gary Holbrin. Uh, Gary is uh, one of the original underground cartoonists, probably most notoriously known for the Air Pirates. Uh, where, uh, he, uh, he litigated with the Walt Disney Company for many years. I think you, you won that one, didn't you, Gary? Uh, a standoff. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, Gary's uh, Gary's been a Nancy aficionado for uh, forever. Uh, next to him is Kaz, and uh, <laughs> it was simply by K A Z because his full name is unpronounceable. <laughs> uh, and uh, Kaz has been. Uh, He's a little too young to have been part of that original underground comics group, but he's like next generation, uh, does that wonderful underworld strip where Nancy and Sluggo periodically appear. And uh, right now he's one of the creative uh, geniuses behind uh, SpongeBob. So. And then we have Peter Maresca who uh, is the publisher of Sunday Books. Uh, if you can afford them, I know you have all those gigantic books that fit no bookshelf that's ever been on. <laughs> Beautiful. And then we have Brian Walker. Uh, Brian is part of the uh, Walker Comics Mafia. Uh, Multi-generational. In fact, uh, well, his father was Mort, uh, his brothers are all in the industry, and his son David is doing a documentary. So uh, if you uh, see people walking around the camera, that's the next generation. So uh, I thought we'd start with just a, a general, how did we get into the Nancy Cult thing? And I should say, uh, the Bushmore Society, until today, was a secret organization. Uh, <laughs> Thanks to the ladies who run the, this museum, we have been forced to go public. And I think we all feel a little awkward about that, but uh, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll start and then we'll give everyone a chance uh, to talk about their entry. I was, uh, from a very early age, attracted to the Nancy comic strip. I couldn't explain why. I do think one of my theories of why it's so popular is it's perhaps one of the earliest things anybody read as a child because it was easy to read and subliminally it's in there and you love it and you can't always rationally explain it. But uh, there are a lot of theories. Uh, the Bushmore Society, to the degree I can explain it, is an organization of aficionados and it's, uh, it's 
I have to say from the beginning, uh, some people think I started it or run it. I, I, in an interview years ago, um, I answered it by saying, uh, if uh, you want to meet Superman, you can't, you know, there's no bat signal for Superman. You go through Jimmy Olsen. I'm kind of the Jimmy Olsen of the Bushmore Society. <laughs> Only because I'm an entrepreneur who's done a lot of uh, books and merchandise over the years, and so I have a, a connection. But nobody knows uh, who's really behind it. We refer to it loosely as uh, the elders. But that's when we were young, and, and now we're all elders, so I don't really know who runs it. My personal hunch is uh, Ernie's old neighbor, Jim Carlson, I think, but nobody knows. Um, but it is hierarchical in the sense that we have membership cards starting with entry level, intermediate, and advanced. And uh, when this is over, we have 35 entry level membership kits for the first 35 people who arranged to be filmed by the documentary folks here. So afterwards, uh, if you aren't already a member, you can become an entry level. So that aside, um, as I said, from the earliest days I was attracted to Nancy, but uh, it was a kind of a love hate too. When I got to my smart aleck stage in college and I was doing satire magazines and early underground comics, more than once I, I made fun of Ernie Bushmore because uh, it was easy to, you know, be an intellectual snob and, and, and I confess, I think I'm not the only one who started out with a bit of a negative uh, attitude, but the more I looked and studied and, uh, and, and, and really I think for me the art is what really sucked me in, there's a perfection, a, what I call a geometric perfection to uh, Ernie Bushmore's art. And uh, I acquired uh, what I almost would call reverence for it. And uh, in fact, uh, speaking of which, uh, you know, the Bushmore Society, as I understand it, is currently a 501c3 nonprofit, but <laughs> considering applying for religious status, because <laughs> uh, it does away with a lot of paperwork. The IRS does not, the IRS does not mess with religion. You can believe in anything. And, you know, they, they, they won't touch you, so that, that may be the next step, and uh, I think that's appropriate. So, uh, so yeah, early on I, I uh, was delighted when I was able to get my first license to do uh, uh, books like uh, Nancy Eats Food and uh, my own favorite, Bums, Beatniks, and Hippies, uh, because, you know, to Ernie they all were kind of alike. They were just guys who didn't like the work and had uh, patches and uh, a lot of facial hair, long hair. And, uh, you know, Ernie, I think, was a self-confessed kind of a square. And so those of us who may have been hippies at one point, you know, I, mean, I never took it personally. Because I, I knew, uh, to me, uh, Ernie was kind of the everyman. And Nancy was, uh, it spoke to everyone. And I think that's part of the appeal that we'll, we'll all address. But uh, I think for those of us who early on uh, developed this reverence for this group and its creator, um, we would could never have dreamed that there would be a, an auditorium room full of people paying to get into a thing called Nancy Fest. <laughs> so it tells me what we've always we used to joke as being a cult. It really is a cult, and you guys prove it. And, uh, I think this is tip of the iceberg because you know, for every one of you, there are some multiple factor of people around the country who uh, share love for this creation. So uh, I think we'll start uh, from your left. Gary, tell us how you got into this. Uh... Oh no, do I have to? <laughs> Uh, actually, I, I like to think there's a big Ernie in the sky, and Ernie spoke to me, and what he said was, go see Dennis Kitchen, <laughs> and I did, but uh, more realistically, I've always loved graphic design, uh, that's what I studied in school, and early Mickey Mouse has got the kind of perfect design that Nancy and Sluggo and all the Bushmore characters have. And so visually, it was number one for me. I think 
one of the reasons I got involved with the Air Pirates was because the early Mickey was a vehicle. He's perfect to mess with, as is Nancy. And I've messed with both of them. That's my job. <laughs> but uh, then I started realizing that the content of Nancy was as universal as its looks. Wow, now we're on to something. <laughs> and so now I've been doing paintings of Nancy. I've even brought a few. You might see them later at the book signings. Um, and the whole oog, did I say that right? Is uh, interesting. I, I can't explain it very well. Dennis did a better job, and that's why Ernie sent me to Dennis. <laughs> Yeah, it's your turn or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I guess my first exposure was my dad would uh, bring home two Sunday papers, uh, the New York Daily News and the Star Ledger from Elizabeth, New Jersey. Uh, and so they both ran uh, Nancy. And for me, <coughs> it was sort of the, the connection to like, old time comics, which I was already in wanted to be a cartoonist uh, as a kid. Um, and, uh, and, and that's where I noticed that the difference between the way that they set up the pages. I think the Star Ledger ran it without the, uh, the top uh, strip, you know, the intro. Uh, and I just found that fascinating. I remember cutting them out, playing with them, moving them around. Uh, and then, you know, I, was, I guess what I was most attracted to was Slugger. Because you know, to me, well, it had to do with the fact that, you know, I grew up in Hoboken, you know, I, I saw these kind of sluggo kind of kids around, and I loved the, the, the East Side comedies, and so, and I loved his house, I loved that sweet fucked up house that he had. <laughs> and so, uh, from when I started doing my own comic strip, uh, a, a weekly comic strip, uh, I was really surprised by how much I absorbed uh, from uh, Bushmill. The idea of, uh, I, I was kind of thinking of him as a sort of a prop comic, you know? You take a prop, you look at it, what can I do with this thing? Um, and I would do the same thing. Uh, just walk around the house, walk around New York City, try to see a hubcap. What else can a hubcap be, you know? Uh, so, I guess, yep, yeah, that's, you know, that's what I want to say. Uh, I guess for, for a good number of years, uh, I was a, a closet Nancy lover. I uh, didn't, didn't want to admit it to a lot of people. I'd hang out with Bill Blackbeard in, uh, in, in Santa Cruz, and we'd never bring it up. And I guess I always loved it as a kid, and then that sort of stayed with me. As a kid, I used to uh, clip out Nancy pages for a month, and then glue them end to end, and roll them up on a pencil, and put them in a shoebox put a hole in the top and walk, read them one frame at a time, continuously. And sometimes it didn't matter if you started in the middle and ended up in the middle of the next one. There's still a, a gag sitting there. Um, so as, as I continued collecting comic strips that I had for the last 60 years or so, um, Nancy never made it to the shed. Uh, like, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, little, little, uh, little iodine did make it to the shed, unfortunately. But Nancy stayed with the great strips, even though I never talked about it. But then along came uh, people like Dennis and, uh, and Brian and Tom Gamble, and I realized I was able to open up and let the world know that I did love Nancy for whatever reason I did, and I still can't explain it fully as well as these guys do. And um, so I guess it was my love as a collector, my, uh, my, my love as a, when I put all the strips together. Um, once I became a publisher, I guess it was a natural thing to, um, help out with this project, Nancy, that, uh, that, that well, Tom and Brian uh, uh, sort of uh, led me into. And that became the book, the catalog for this show, which, by the way, as Dennis mentioned, uh, people who can't afford my giant books, uh, Ernie was for the gum chewers, not the caviar eaters. This book is for the gum chewers and the caviar eaters, because some of us do both. And so, uh, yeah, make sure you, you do grab a book before you go. It is cheap. <laughs> uh, I guess that's, uh, the, I, I plugged the book, I told my history, so uh, that's <laughs> uh, Brian, before you talk, I want to, besides what I already said about Brian, he was the curator of this amazing art exhibit, 
And he, I mean, I have to say for myself, best comic card exhibit I ever attended. So of course I grew up like every other kid in the 50s, <coughs> seeing Nancy in the newspaper, but I don't really remember much about the early years of my life. But I do remember seeing uh, Nancy in Mad Magazine. Uh, my father was probably uh, you know, growing up in a cartoon household with Mort Walker as your father. Uh, it was a little bit different than most kids' upbringing. Uh, my father had a subscription to Mad Magazine when I was growing up. And my brother Greg and I would pilfer these from the studio. And you know, I had to watch them under the bed. And my father would He'd come in and said, who stole my Mad Magazine? <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee no other kids my age had that. <laughs> but I remember seeing some of the Nancy parodies in there, and I said, oh, okay, there's something going on here, but I'm not quite sure. Hmm. Of course, growing up in the 60s, you know, I, got, I had my underground period and my Marvel sil Silver Age fatuation and everything else. And, and then by the time I was in college in the 70s, <clears throat> I was reading Doonesbury, like, Everybody else in my generation, he was my hero, and, and at that time, I developed a real dislike for Nancy. I mean, I was convinced that nobody read Nancy except little kid, kids and old ladies. You know? <laughs> and as I said yesterday, I got this call from David Stanford, and he talked me into doing a Nancy book. You know, and I said, "Why am I doing this?" And as I traveled around and started talking to people like. Uh, and Jerry Moriarty and Art Spiegelman and, and Paul and Mark and, and other people in the sort of New York underground scene, of course, Bill, uh, I became a convert. I, I crossed to the other side, started drinking the Kool-Aid. <laughs> By the time I finished the book, I was, I was sunk, you know. But also as a professional cartoonist, I really, and this is actually more recently when I really started studying Bush Miller's work and particularly his his gag writing, his structure. You know, it's 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 so precise, so perfect that any cartoonist I think can learn a lot from him. Uh, my father when he first moved to Connecticut, uh, Ernie was one of his neighbors uh, and we'd bump into him occasionally and my father's probably one of the few people that actually heard Ernie's advice straight from his lips. Dumb it down, Mort. You gotta dumb it down. <laughs> and my father's version of that was more funny pictures. <laughs> and in our gag conferences, writing for Beetle Bailey, you know, with Jerry Dumas and my brother Greg, my father would say that frequently. More funny pictures, too much talking. <laughs> and so that, those were our marching orders. And um, so obviously I've developed deep reverence for Ernie Bushmore. Uh, Taz mentioned uh, Sluggo's uh, House. Uh, one of the books I did was How Sluggo Survives, which is always a mystery. I mean, <laughs> no parents, I mean, Nancy had, and her parents, which she had, and Fritzy, but Sluggo lived alone in this ramshackle house. The yard was looked like a junkyard, and uh, the one thing I remember, which is inspiring the next merchandise we do, is you know on the wall where the plaster is flown away, you see the lathing. I don't know what you call that, but the, the wall reveal. That's going to be the next thing, decals that you can put in your living room wall. Uh, so, uh, and speaking of which, we are going to be a. Uh, stepping up the merchandising program. If anybody has ideas, suggestions, we're open to it. I think the uh, silk ties that have long been out of print are going to be reissued. <laughs> so, welcome feedback. Um, you want to uh, do this next, uh, Brian? Or oh, you want to lead into it? Yeah. Tell us what, why, one of the reasons why we call this meeting yeah. um, is so that we just will explain we've been getting some from not bat signals, but something similar in the mail. And you know, we're not sure what it's all about. And, you know, we'll, we'll tell you about it. Yeah, those of us who are, have been known for being part of the Bushmiller cult for a while have been getting anonymous 
letters in the mail, no return address, different postmarks, and we're just getting Nancy panels. <laughs> and uh, in my case, the panels were all money oriented, which I kind of took offense at, but, <laughs> uh, but everyone else got uh, different messages. So, uh, Brian, why don't you start the slideshow? And this is uh, Nancy delivering the, these cryptic panels. This is a, a, a photo of one of the envelopes that Dennis got. <laughs> so we discovered in talking among ourselves that there's some commonality in terms of the types of panels that each of us have been receiving. Uh, Dennis, Dennis's ones are mostly about money. Uh, I'm not sure how you take that, Dennis, or whether you're a greedy capitalist or... I think it's encouraging me to do more merchandise. That's what I do. <laughs> you're great, you're great. Dennis has gotten the most of these. I don't know. You know, somebody is really <laughs> on his case. <laughs> now, on the other hand, I've been getting panels in the mail that relate to artwork and museums and you know modern art, paintings, exhibits. Uh, Kind of makes sense a little bit, you know. <clears throat> somebody's telling me to do more Nancy exhibits. Um, so now that this one uh, I'm doing so well with Steve, uh, I think my next mission is to go to the Museum of Modern Art and talk them into doing a Mary Bush movie. It's a long shot, but you know, we, we need to get started on this soon. Um, the gauntlet is laid. Oh yeah, those are mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't figure this out because at first I was maybe just collecting, but maybe the idea of books. Uh, it's just carrying stacks of books from the library and reading their Apple Air might have had something to do with this uh, this strange last minute idea to make a book of, of, of Brian's exhibit here. Uh, so I guess the message is that to um, continue doing that sort of thing and or Maybe even it's telling me ahead of time that it's time for a second printing of the book, even though it's not in stores yet. How about one of the 10 pound books, you know? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's a veiled threat, you know, publish or perish. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, she seems to be working hard at it and enjoying it, and that's pretty much what my life about the Nancy book was. Actually, these, these are ones that Gary has been getting. Uh -oh. <laughs> they seem to have a little, a little violent. I, I take this in the abstract to be more uh, rebellious and or uh, uh, anarchic. Yeah. Not violent. <laughs> yeah. and that's illegal. <laughs> I think it's a little bit of uh, maybe chaos. Anarchy. Oh, yeah. yeah. That suits you. Oh, I said anarchic. That's a that's a oh, word. Yeah. Oh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you get after being sued by Disney. Iconoplastic. Yeah. <laughs> oh, isn't that what volcanoes do? <laughs> yeah, that's great. You know, I, no, I, I like this. I, I think it, it suits my uh, sort of my history in comics in a way. Um, the violence is a little disturbing, but. Uh, well, they're yeah. a troublemaker. Yeah. Troublemaker. Yeah. yeah, and that's fun. You know, making trouble is fun. As long as you don't get sued for a million bucks because of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they knew you had those deep pockets. Well, you know, that's why we, we could stand it off because uh, in 1979, uh, there was a, a, a big art show at Phil Sewing's convention, the Mouse Liberation Front Art Show. I recruited a lot of people from the portrait industry in Provincetown to do anything they wanted with any Disney character they wanted. There was some marvelous art created for that show. Uh, it was sold to help us pay our uh, legal bills. Uh, and it would be a wonderful book if it was only legally printed. 
Because you can make all the art you want, if anybody you want, but you can't make additions. That's the copyright. We know, uh, we know that some of these have some great Bernie Bushmiller sound effects, you know, zoom, bang, crash. Yeah. Yeah, those are those are and atomic and symbols, spurls and uh, emanata and well, those, those are fun drawings, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> I like the one with the, the whatever that gob is in her face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then Kaz has been getting some really strange stuff. <laughs> Not surprising. Really. <laughs> These panels really, really speak to me. Uh, my love of horror, my love of uh, surrealism and, and Dada, and uh, just pure absurdism, absurd humor. Um, underwear. Uh, un underwear. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Crazy Town. I did a, uh, I did an episode of uh, SpongeBob uh, called SpongeBob and Randy. And it was the first time that uh, they got me to design all, all the backgrounds and all the characters. And it was a completely absurd uh, neighborhood in Bikini Bottom uh, that we might revisit. But a lot of this stuff is very much, especially Crazy Town over here, was a big, big inspiration for me. So what do you think of this means, these, uh, these panels to you? What are you supposed to do? Kind of direction. You know, I have no idea, but uh, I'm thinking that probably towards the end of my life, I'm, I'm supposed to put all these together somehow, and then it will all come to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I will be enlightened, and then I die. <laughs> and then you go to, to you crazy town. <laughs> exactly. So, so buttons. We're, we're trying to decide, you know, these panels all relate to secrecy and disguise and initiation rites. And, you know, maybe this is a more of a general call to arms uh, about what we're trying to do here. Uh, Could be a past, present, and future. Yeah. You notice that, as, as Pete noticed yesterday, there's one where Nancy's bringing along a whole bunch of her friends from the neighborhood, and maybe there's something there about telling us that maybe we need to expand the society and add some new members. And, and uh, you know, we, we're we sort of still entry level members, um, but if we recruit some more you're, level, you're only entry level? <laughs> <laughs> you, you never gave me a promotion. <laughs> you're a middle manager, we know that. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of us, but um, I don't really have, you know, You started out part of the youth movement. Yeah. <laughs> I'm only a few years younger. But if we can recruit some new members, then that might push us up into the middle level and above, possibly. Right. Maybe we could become elders. Well, we get a piece of everything below us, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's kind of a pyramid scheme. <laughs> so get in early. <laughs> and then get your friends in. There's, it's actually, it, there's no charge, right, to join? Well, like I said, the first 35 today, it's uh, free. Normally $50. <laughs> free today. You get the, the membership card, and I have a box of buttons. You have a button of your choice, and that's your, your kit. Um, and now that we are, I guess, public, thanks to uh, Caitlin and Jenny, uh, I think uh, we may need to have a newsletter. We'll need somebody who'll be a recording secretary. Or so if we see a raise of hands for volunteers, <laughs> we have to go public, we'll do it first class. And can I request next time we have a, a, a public meeting, we do it in some tropical place? <laughs> Maybe with a resort, the swimming pool, or something like that. Maybe. We'll, we'll see what the treasury permits. <laughs> I'd also like to see a financial report. Uh, yeah, I'd like to see Valentine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't so see much religion now. No paperwork. <laughs> this is another <clears throat> group of panels that suggest that maybe we need to go even more public. You know. Show on, or 
you know. You mean like a festival? Entertain. Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Or a fest, even. Yes. It's that's shorter, right? Yeah. Catch you? Yeah. yeah. It's an yeah. inhale. Yeah. Okay. I think we've already got a good start here. But, you know, blow our horns a little bit more. You know, shout to the rooftops. But, uh, you know, we're, we're just struggling, obviously, with <laughs> what it is that we, what we feel like we're being instructed to do. I'm struggling with what to say in front of this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do think, we generally think it's an urge to expand. <laughs> and, uh, so those of you who have just been kind of couch potatoes, uh, if you want to get actively involved, I think it's the opportunity now. Uh, can I read that? Can I read that out loud? Excuse yeah. me for breaking in. That's, I, I saw that one yesterday on the wall, and I said, oh, that's a genius, you know, because there's sound effects. It goes like this. Dum, dum, dum. Dum, 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 dum. dum. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could get someone to compose a, uh, like a theme song. We could all sing together. Yeah. Like the Mickey Mouse Club theme. And if you look at the exhibit, I believe that original's there. You can uh, find what that dum dum leads to. Really? Yeah. 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 That's what a Tom said. Yeah. yeah. It's like Alley Oop has a song. How come Nancy and Slaughter? Uh, and song? I think it ought to be right. right. Yeah. So, any songwriters in the group be strongly <laughs> encouraged. Something catchy. Something uh, inspiring. I was really so fascinated by the fact that there's no periods. Yeah. Um, what happened to the punctuation? Yeah. I mean, there are, you know, question marks and, and so on, but yeah. it, is there a deeper meaning to that? I, I know who to ask. Right over here, these two guys, <laughs> Parasic and Newgarden. Yeah, where are they? They don't know, nobody knows. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, on their panel, we'll ask. Yeah, I think I smell another book then. <laughs> Nancy, period. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is, is a sequel possible? We'll see. Can I do the salacious version? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's yours to sell under that. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to uh, let everybody give a little uh, a personal story about uh, either the, uh, the appreciation for the strip or for Ernie himself. I know early on when I was doing those books, I wanted to uh, interview him for one of the books. And uh, so I, I got the phone number and I called uh, Stanford, Connecticut, and Abby Bushmiller answered the phone and I said, I'm Dennis Kitchen, I'm a publisher in Wisconsin. I am doing a series of books. I'd like to interview Mr. Bushmiller. And she said, call the syndicate, click. <laughs> Called back, thought maybe I didn't word it carefully enough, and I said, uh, I have already been in touch with the syndicate, and I have a license, and I would like to interview him. And she said, call the syndicate. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know how to interpret it other than Ernie doesn't want to be disturbed, and uh, because he was a workaholic from all accounts. And so that was one of my great frustrations. I didn't at least have a, even a brief phone conversation where he said, you know, call the syndicate. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering if anybody else uh, on the panel uh, had a actual contact with Ernie, wanted to, was rebuffed. Any, anybody else? To... Uh, Jerry Modardi uh, played a, a recording, a tele uh, telephone recording. Oh, he did. Tell when us. He, when he called uh, Ernie. Uh, I don't remember everything, but I do remember that uh, he kept asking Jerry, uh, you do a kid strip? You do a kid strip? <laughs> and and it, finally, Jerry realized, oh my god, he's asking me if I'm doing comics for kids. But he did sound like a, like a little mobster. You know? <laughs> I heard a very gravelly voice. Oh, yeah. 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 That was fun. I didn't. Uh I probably saw him at you know NCS gatherings occasionally when I was younger, but I don't really remember much. But when I first graduated from college in 1974, and I started working at the Museum of Cartoon Art in Greenwich, Connecticut. And one day, Ernie K 
came to the museum, and my father and Jack Tippett were taking him out to lunch, and I shook his hand, and I said, hello, Mr. Bushmiller. He was very nice and polite, and that was about the extent of it. But I knew that they had taken him out to lunch, and he felt very, you know, he must have had a good time, because we found out quite, you know, when he passed away in 82, he left us a large, Bequeath for the museum, mm. which which was a significant amount of money for us at that time, because we were just kind of struggling to keep the the doors open all the time, and we're like, wow, that was really nice of him. And I know he gave a large uh, amount of money to the Milk Gross Fund of the National Cartoon Society. So, and, th and this was all very private, you know. He, mm -hmm. There was no public, you know, handing over the check or anything like that. He was a very modest man. Um, but you know, I, I regret you know, when I started working on my book. I would have, I would have loved to have yeah. been able to interview him uh, first person. Right. But the next best thing was talking to Jim Carlson, uh, who actually just coincidentally, when I was working on the Ernie Bushmiller book, I was complaining to a friend of mine who's a lawyer in Stanford about the lack of material that I was coming up with, particularly from the syndicate. The syndicate didn't have complete proofs at the time. And my friend said, I know some guy who I think was a neighbor of Ernie Bushmiller, and I know him from my estate work. Uh, you know, Jim is a, does a lot of antiques appraisals and estate settlements, and my friend is a, a lawyer who works on estates. So he introduced me to Jim, and we, Connected, and I suddenly realized I just tapped into the mother love because Jim had saved and protected and probably preserved from being distributed or sold off or you know, scattered around through the family or something. Not only artwork, which many of the pieces in Tom's collection come from from Jim's holdings, uh, but photographs and, and the letters. They will eventually come to Ohio State. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, Jim and I unless, came. Unless I'm uh, mysteriously murdered by Tony Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> but if you get a chance to talk to Jim, it's like the next best thing to talking to Ernie. Because I know Tom's been grilling him for months about you know, what kind of scotch do you drink? What time? What time do you wake up in the morning? You'll find out tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Watching the, uh, the little film clip of uh, Ernie last night, I thought he was doing a Tom bit. <laughs> it's not. But um. You know, and then two years later, when we did the exhibit at the museum, uh, Jim gave us also a nice funding to help renovate the second floor. My brother Neil was here, ended up building all new frames for the artwork. Uh, we got carpeting and track lighting and everything. And then, of course, that opening exhibit at the museum was just fabulous. And, and so, uh, why don't you stand up and take a wave, Jim? Jim, a question. Jim, Shoot. what kind of car did Ernie drive? Uh, he had a Buick Skylark, uh -huh. and the most beautiful yellow, and he had the first Cadillac El Dorado. Ooh, oh, that's the kind of answer I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> he dies, he seldom drove it, and when he got Parkinsonism, I drove it maybe two three times a year to change the oil and give it a little spin here and there and, and, and so forth. Yes, and in that day, people did not do vintage cars. It would be worth something. It would be wonderful today. Abby's favorite color was yellow, and it predominates in design. She was a New York City Bronx lady, and she came to Connecticut and turned in, like many city ladies, dealt with and run across one of the best horticulture and garden and design people. Oh, thanks, Jim. Leave it to Gary to ask those tough questions. I don't know about that, too. <laughs> well, you know, ever since the question, what would Jesus drive, came up. <laughs> uh, I think it's a Volvo 1800E. <laughs> 
so it sounds like almost all of us started out with uh, having some reservations about Nancy, maybe uh, thinking, you know, we were too smart for it or whatever. What was the moment, if each of you remember, when you first thought, there's something deeper here, there's something going on, it's not just a dumb strip, but it speaks to me in a different way. I, th I think for me it was uh, uh, when I went to art school and I had uh, Jerry Moriarty as a teacher. Uh, now, I had been reading Nancy and clipping them, uh, mostly because, like I said, I, I, I just like that sort of connection to the old world of cartooning. But with him, it seemed like it was some kind of like a deeper, like beatnik meaning that was going on there. Uh, and, 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 uh, in this kind of art way where, you know, you could interpret abstract work, you could mm -hmm. interpret surrealism and whatever, but for some reason, Butch Miller's work, you could project into it so much, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Even though it's so crazily sim simple, you know? Yeah. Hey, I was gonna ask you guys, um, so the idea that uh, Ernie would have the last panel, and he called it Snapper, and then he'd work his way backwards. Has anybody tried doing that? I tried, I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. No, I can't I'm say sure. that. You do it? I start in the middle sometimes and go either ah. way. <laughs> <laughs> it ends up nowhere. <laughs> that's, that's why I don't write, Agar. <laughs> Well, I had this. I had this idea that he was a uh, Bushmiller was a like a forensic cartoonist, mm. right? Because there's a crime scene, which is the punchline, right? And then you find you have to step backwards all the way backwards to figure out how he got there. Well, yeah. Mm. I, I remember when uh, I was uh, in college and I was a full-fledged hippie, with hair down the middle of my back, scraggly hair. And at that time, I, I loved all the comics. I mean, Little Abner was actually probably my favorite growing up. But when Al Cap started satirizing hippies, yeah. he, did it in, he did it in a mean way. He hated hippies. But when Ernie did it, he was making fun of them, but they were lovable, they were friendly. Like, they're not gonna hurt you. But in Al Cap's strip, they looked like they were gonna hit you with a blackjack. <laughs> <laughs> Does that, that sound familiar? Anybody else here? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I've always loved Meta comics, comics about comics. I collect them in a folder. On every time I see one on, on a website, I drag it into the folder. You know, you know, there's all kinds of self-referential humor where the cartoonist puts themselves into the strip, like Bud Fisher did back in the teens. And and, um, and I discovered when I did the book and the exhibit that Ernie did a lot of that. You know, it used to be. I know Charles Schultz told me like I don't I don't do that very much. It seems sort of gratuitous or something, you know. Um, but I discovered, you know, looking at his strips frequently, he would have his hand reaching in, you know, signing his name, or he'd take a day off on Labor Day and Nancy and Sluggo would take over, or, and some, some, you know, one of my favorite ones is in the exhibit, you know, where she's looking into a pond and seeing her reflection, and it's, you know, it's both, you can turn it upside down and look at it both ways. It's, it's just so clever. And there was another strip where the punchline was anything can happen in a comic strip. And, uh, I, I think that Ohio State did an entire exhibit with that as the title. And so you'll notice in the exhibit, uh, there's a whole section called Fourth Wall. And take a look at that. And, and because it, you know, there's sort of endless possibilities there. Right. And so that was an area yeah. of his work that I really Those loved. strips really yeah. inspired me too. Yeah. Uh, I once did a strip where my main character actually drew my comic strip and brought it to me to show me. And I said, well, it's not finished. He was winning it's not finished because he, he forgot to sign my name. <laughs> well, Brian, you mentioned uh, Charles Schultz. There's an early interview with Schultz where he, he talked about how when Peanuts was at a point where it wasn't as popular as it became, and he said, with every cartoonist, newspapers will add it. Sometimes they'll drop it, and every time you know your syndicate notifies you, a newspaper drops it. So it was very disappointing, and there would be maybe a few letters complaining. But he said, when a newspaper would drop Nancy, they got hate mail. <laughs> and that was my first clue to again how passionate the readers are. What we 
call ourselves, we are just a small fraction of all the people who intensely love this group. And it goes back decades. And uh, the Bushmiller Society is just one manifestation of, I think, a, a love that's uh, probably unmatched <laughs> in the other strip. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's like when uh, somebody was asking me about uh, the artist who took over Nancy after Ernie died, and he said, what do you think of the guy Gilchrist? And I said, well, let me put it this way, there will never be a Gilchrist society. <laughs> so. was, or at least we wouldn't know who was running that either. <laughs> well, that's true enough. Yeah, so, uh, excuse me, Dennis. I just wanted to say that uh, Gilchrist took that job away from me. Oh, no kidding. No kidding. Wow. And I will say that I didn't really start to get Nancy properly until I was asked if I was interested in taking over the script. And so I, you know, because I, I told you earlier, the graphics always attracted me, you know, that, that composition, the uh, utter simplicity and genius yeah. of the way he could put, put a scene together. <laughs> So, it's but I had, you know, reading it, so these gags, I can do that, that's simple. And then once I got into it, oh no, it's not simple. <laughs> you know, uh, that snapper is uh, a hard thing to come by day after day after day. It, I had six weeks to put together a presentation of six weeks for the skips. It took me all six weeks. And when I got there with the stuff, I said, I'm not sure if I can do this. I guess they read my mind because they didn't give me the job. <laughs> right? And it would have been a really big damn shoe to get into, Ernie Bushmiller. So I, I applaud him and I applaud anybody that's got the chutzpah to take over Nancy. And I guess I would include our current artist. Uh, what's your name? Yeah, <laughs> I, I should add, I failed to say when I introduced Gary briefly, he is, and has been for some years now, the ghost for Hagar the Horrible. It's, uh, you know, he, doesn't, he doesn't get the sign up, but uh, now you know. Um, and he fills Dick Brown's shoes, I think, seamlessly. You know, you, you can't tell. A better so. fit. I mean, I love Ernie, but he's un, un, undoable, let's say that. Yeah. And it's very deceptively simple. If any of you who, who do draw, you try to draw Nancy and Sluggo in his style. It's very daunting. Um, I'm one of the ones in the gallery who has a parody on the wall. And, I mean, it's, uh, it's daunting. There's really a geometry to it. And uh, again, people who dismiss it as being simpleton, no, it's the opposite. Taz, I mean, you do it in your own style, but I mean, if you had to mimic Bushmiller, if you were the ghost, man, that's that's not an easy thing to do. You no, know, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the strips that it, the, in the show of mine, uh, the, the panel of uh, you see Sluggo's house. Yeah. <laughs> I I did it on the light box because there's no way that I can do uh, it myself. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that was interesting with the clip I showed last night of Bill Griffith. Uh, doesn't even attempt to do that. You know, yeah. it's all cut and paste because you know, he's yeah. a purist. That's that's. Uh, Bill's on the very reverent edge of uh, <laughs> the artist who will not even draw it in his own biography, <laughs> which uh, I think defines how much respect you had for him. Um, so this was originally a one-hour panel. Um, Caitlin informed us that we have extra time now because Olivia's were shortened, so we're going to have more time for uh, some Q&A. And I thought also, now that you know uh, this is becoming a religious organization, <laughs> do we have any maybe testimonials? Anybody want to stand and uh, give a testimony? Well, how about a moment of prayer? <laughs> <laughs> if, any, if, if we uh, accept your testimonial, then you will be able to to have a membership card entry level and a button which you can pick up after the panel. And also, <clears throat> if for anyone that doesn't have time, uh, you can find David with the camera 
and give your testimonial on video and also earn a membership card. Right. So if, if, anybody, there are no, sorry, if anybody has a question or a testimonial, uh, we have these fancy microphones that we'll be uh, bringing around. Ah, great. Okay. So I don't see anybody standing yet, but we have a lot of hands. So. I have a testimonial, and uh, like Dennis, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> my name is Michael, and um, I am a Bushmiller aholic. Um, like Dennis, I grew up in Wisconsin, and I read the Milwaukee Journal's green sheet, which was a four-page folded insert in uh, the Daily uh, Daily Milwaukee Journal, and um, that's where I love to read Nancy. I started with Nancy. I learned to read reading Nancy. But I had a 40-year career in the business end of comics. And my first comics job I applied for in 1982 at a company called Capital City Distribution. They asked me what my favorite comic was. My response was, does the, me getting the job depend on this? <laughs> <laughs> they said no. I said fine. Ernie Bushmiller's Nancy. <laughs> you can pick up your card afterwards. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Steve from the Philadelphia area. This is a question, not a testimonial. I, I, I think notoriously, for me anyway, the Nancy strip contains many, many mysteries. There's a lot more, for me, we don't know than what we do know. One of the deepest and strangest mysteries is that Nancy has no parents. So my question is, what would you imagine her parents to be? So maybe like Ernie and Abby. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think anybody happened, have a theory? Or? What happened to them? That's the big question. Yeah. Did they die in a car accident? Well, did they <laughs> abandon her? Yeah. They were kidnapped by the Bushmiller Society. <laughs> <laughs> did they move to move in their house just to get out of the rain? Huh? And and how come Aunt Fritzy and Phil Fumble never married? Uh, I always thought Phil Fumble was a stand-in for Ernie. Anybody agree? Really? Yeah. 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 They kind of look very similar, and uh, I mean the name Fumble, this nice self-deprecating humor you expect from from him. But yeah, it is one of many mysteries, like like how Sluggo survived. Uh, and uh, didn't the authorities ever step in? Is homeless? Anyway, he wasn't homeless technically. How did he pay the electric bill? I guess he didn't have. He didn't have a lot of odd jobs. He did. He did. I would, don't know what happened to Nancy's parents, but I would imagine that they were, it was a, it was a, it was a mixed marriage between a, a professor and a food service worker. Hello. I love this microphone. Um, my name's Todd Webb, came from Virginia Beach, I'm a cartoonist also. Uh, it was Brian's book that led me to Nancy. Um, this isn't so much a question or a testimonial, but I've talked to Brian and Dennis about this, so I'll, I'll just throw it out to the entire room. Um, I was a guest on a podcast that's peanut-centric and was asked the question if Charles Schultz is the number one acknowledged cartoonist who would be my pick for number two. So I said Bernie Bushmiller and the host turned on me <laughs> in a nanosecond and said I was lying. <laughs> Anybody who said they loved Nancy was lying. <laughs> That's why so many of us hide it. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to make this known to everybody. Um, the podcast has a hotline. <laughs> Specifically um, to the other cartoonists that are here, um, but anybody that wants to um, just come up to me at any time today and I will call the hotline and you can leave a message. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I mean, you shouldn't feel too bad. There are some people that think the Bushmiller Society is fake. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're out of the closet now. Um, I was just wondering what, what everybody thinks of the uh, Olivia James uh, Sluggo is lit thing, especially in the context of being after years of Bill Price. Bill Price. I mean, I'm sure we all have our own opinion. I, I mean, I, I like that she is showing an homage to Bushmiller stylistically, and yet has brought it into you know the 2020s with cell phones and modernity. And I think from the syndicate's point of view, it's a smart choice. Also to have a woman doing a script starring a woman makes sense to me. So I think she's the best to follow since the syndicate owns it. If it was me, I would have let the script die when Ernie retired, but the syndicate's not going to do that, so I don't know what do you guys think? I haven't seen it. Oh, I haven't seen it. <laughs> no, I, I agree that it has a, a similar sensibility, and the thing that I think she carries forth best is is the, the surreal aspects yeah. of the script, and goes there maybe even more than Ernie did, but still, it's something that the modern audience is going to appreciate more than a lot of the other things that are in this time. I mean, to me, in an ideal world, they would give her her own script and you know whatever Olivia wanted to do. But it's it's a work for hire gig, and uh, you know Gary almost did it. A number of people almost did. Ivan Brunetti tried out. That would have been a hoot, you know, uh, for those of you who know his work. I read a book that came out recently called The New Nancy by a college professor. And I, you know, it, I was really trying to fully understand what she's doing. And I read it every day on, on Go Comics. And I have developed an appreciation for it. And not every strip is hilarious. Some of it's a little self-indulgent. But what I explained in the book is it's kind of a hybrid between you know, a 20th century print-only comic done by a, a you know, middle-aged white guy uh, with an internet uh, female cartoonist whose background, I, I understand, is in web comics and knows how to, how to survive in that world and has developed an a impressive following of people who follow what she's doing. So she, she's doing a daily syndicated comic strip that appears in the newspaper, as Ernie did, but also really essentially a, a web comic. And uh, it's kind of an interesting experiment in the future of comics, I think. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm supposed to save my voice, but I gotta jump in. We, uh, we should give a shout out to Mark Lasky, whose work is uh, in the thing. He, he took it over right after Ernie, and he was doing a great job, and he was 30, but then he, he died. But it was, if you look at his stuff, I had never seen his stuff in, uh, until the, the show. But some of the good. first group, those are four months after he died. Yeah, yeah. And also, uh, the first time I met Jerry Trudeau, I was like, oh, I'm a big fan, I'm a big fan. But you know, my favorite is Ernie Bushmiller, and Jerry Trudeau looked like I had punched him in the stomach. <laughs> 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 All right, I'll stop talking, I'll see you tonight. <laughs> or just going through life, we can turn to Nancy because she doesn't mince her emotions. When she's happy, she's happy. When she's sad, she's bawling her eyes out. And she it rarely carries over to the next strip. She's always new, and you always know exactly how she feels. She wants to watch TV, she's watching TV. So I think just that when I'm having a hard time, I can just watch TV. I can just like Christmas, like love Slugo. And I just want to thank you guys for everything you do. Just since Brian Walford mentioned it, I'm the person who wrote the new Nancy book. <laughs> Jeff Carnegie. But thank you for reading it, because I mean, most academic books get about 10 readers. <laughs> but if, if anybody wants to talk about Olivia James, I'm more than happy to. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, 
Hey, my name's Brian. Uh, I came to Nancy in high school from reading uh, Zippy the Pinhead. That's when I first saw her here. Yeah. I've always thought reading Zippy and those strips that have uh, Nancy in them is like the best way, at least for me, to like fully understand Nancy and like really like beyond uh, beyond like whatever what you just the simple gags like I, that's where I started to understand the zen of it and like how much more there was to understand Nancy and so I was curious if any of you guys ever had any epiphany moments like how I had reading Zippy I felt like I had tons of epiphany moments and even reading Brian Walker's book and reading those essays it was like giving new life to Nancy like all the time I think that they can always there's always more to it and I was curious if any of you guys had any experiences like that throughout your Nancy fandom. food gags, whatever. The new one that just came out is recycled some of those, but it's also the money gags, because there were a lot of those too. And, uh, so I think with, with, with Nancy, there's almost like something for everybody. Uh, one of the new buttons we made is a, one of Ernie's cats, which be kind to animals. And so it always says, he loved animals in a strip, and they all were just drawn so cute. It was the cutest dog, the cutest cat, cutest bird. You could just tell he loved animals without ever specifically saying it. Uh, but early on, I recognized there was a kind man behind the strip, which again, to use say, Al Cap is the opposite. I <laughs> loved <laughs> this strip. I thought he was a very smart satirist, but not a nice man. <laughs> I just want to say I appreciate the compliments about my book. Um, I think the best compliment I've gotten so far is from Bill Griffith, who said, you know, the good thing about your book is it is truly the best of the revolution of Nancy. So I think if you curate any comic strip selectively, you, know, you, it, you can make it, I'm not going to say better than it was, yeah. but... Bill pointed out, if you did the complete Nancy from the beginning to the end, you say, this guy was a pretty good cartoonist. He was around for a long time. He wasn't always funny. He repeated himself sometimes. Yeah. And Bill told me last night that he felt that the exhibit is sort of like a, you know, a gallery version of that same concept. And, and, uh, I will also say that I found a couple boxes in my garage. I mean, the book is pretty much out of print, so they'll be for sale later today. Benefit to uh, Billy Ireland. Yeah. 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 Let me add to that too. Also, that um, the Nancy catalog book, the uh, book for this show that'll be around this afternoon. We all took a little bit for our time, but all of the profits of the book are going to go to the museum. Ooh. Hello, David Matthews. And aging Generation Xer. I got into Nancy during the 1980s. I even drew a Nancy themed editorial cartoon for Lee's college student paper. However, I based Nancy upon the Jerry Scott version, so please forgive me. <laughs> Anyhow, I also alter Nancy panels for the remixed Nancy Bushmiller site on Facebook. that Ernie drew word balloons so well. His word balloons contain ex exact amount of words needed for the gag, no more, nor less. And I try to keep that in mind whenever putting my smart alecky dialogue into them. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Rob. 
Roger. I'm coming out here with my family from Ithaca, uh, New York, and uh, grew up reading the Nancy strips in the Washington Post when I was a kid, and I can't really say that any of them stuck with me, uh, except uh, that interest was revived, or I kind of discovered that what was in it kind of through a sideways avenue discovering Joe Brainerd's work, his, his, Nancy, um, his Nancy book. And also, uh, when I found Nancy Eats Food uh, in a bookstore in Tucson when I was in graduate school, I just fell over backwards. And I'm sorry I didn't buy all of them because it costs like $800 on eBay now. Uh, so, so yeah, if I ever want to, you know, if I have to pay a, my phone bill, uh, I may have to sell it all. Uh, but anyhow, th I've, I'm curious what your opinions are of uh, uh, Joe Brainerd, because that's an interesting crossover from the, the comic strip world to the fine arts world, and I just think he does some really interesting stuff with that. So, but also, thank you for Nancy Eats Food, because it's, it fills me up. Uh, I don't know, I'm not sure if I have quite an answer. I, I like Brainerd's Nancy better than Warhol's. I think Warhol's just was kind of a one-off with him, but with Brainerd, it was an obsession. Yeah. Uh, you get the Brainerd book, the Nancy book. Uh, he did cartoons. He did all kinds of crazy parodies. Nancy as a boy. Have you seen that? Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah. I think Brainerd was the pop artist that he got it the best. I'll say I was on vacation once in Miami Beach looking for something to do it. I went to a bookstore. I found Brainerd's book. Oh, this is the best vacation ever. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Gary is also a painter who's done dozens of inspirational paintings based on Anthony's photo. And I think he brought some. That you can maybe see him. Can you have private yeah, answer? Sure. Well, they'll, they'll be at the table, I guess. At the uh, table, at the yeah. signing table. So check those out. Anybody else want to talk about Brainerd? Uh, Uh, hello, my name is uh, Ruben, and I'm here with my girlfriend who had to step out for a little bit. Um, but we both uh, really much enjoy Nancy. We found it uh, on this Facebook page, uh, or on this Twitter page called uh, Nancy by Ernie Bushmiller, maybe two years ago by this fellow named Johnny, uh, who uh, he reposts you know the strips uh, daily. Um, it's kind of incredible that even in 2020, it still works as a daily strip even if you're just um, indulging on it online um, but one of the reasons that we took uh, you know this, this this grasp of it uh, was because she really reminded us of a kid in our lives which I'm sure there's other people who feel that way um, and that year which was 2022 um, she for, for Christmas she made ourselves and her little sister who reminds us of Nancy this little book uh, to give to her, which is called Kiki or Nancy, and it's just uh, <laughs> pictures we take of her that look like, uh, you know, comic strips uh, that, that uh, Ernie put out there of, of Nancy and some of the best reactionary faces. Um, and it's it's not something, this is not a plug, it's something we're selling. Or anything like that. This is just something she made for her little sister, who's uh, five or six years old. Um, who uh, also kind of took to the comics every time she would see us uh, reading the book or um, you know reading them online. Um, so I think while uh, everyone's uh, you know story with Nancy uh, is special, I think so many of it, so much of it is not unique because, uh, like it's been mentioned before, it's for the uh, you know everyday person. Um, so whether it's you know a kid in your life that it reminds you of, or you uh, you know you studied art and you know you, you see the uh, the uh, the the value of of uh, you know the way his drawings are um, or his lettering or anything like that, I think it offers uh, so much for so many different people. Um, and whether you're five or twenty five or 40 or 50 or 60, um, you know, it continues to live on. 
Um, so that's my testimony. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and also, shout out to Cats. SpongeBob didn't get a big applause before, but I, and I noticed, but shout out. Face the bird, Cat. Face the bird, SpongeBob. I don't want to get sued. <laughs> uh, yeah, hi, I'm Dick Anderson. Uh, I came here from Los Angeles. Uh, this is a lot more entertaining than the mandatory uh, AA meetings I once had. <laughs> Which is another story. But uh, I just wanted to say first, thank you, Brian and Dennis. Uh, Brian, your, your book was the gateway drug for me into an appreciation of Nancy. And Dennis, the, those compilations, are just classics. I have shared those with so many other people and really turned other people on to a full appreciation of Nancy, um, thanks especially to your books. Uh, the question I wanted to ask was, um, and I noticed I've never seen the Nancy cartoon that was made in the 40s, but do you think it is possible to successfully translate Nancy into another medium? You mean like animation? Or yeah, yes, the cartoon is Yeah, yeah. Wasn't there a cartoon, uh, like a Archie's cartoon. A TV funnies uh, that did Nancy and that did Smokey Stover? It didn't work. There are two short Terry tunes of Nancy, but they don't get her hair right. You can't animate that hair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll I, know, I know how Bill Field feels about this. No. <laughs> Well, let's get a live action, Nancy. That's what I want. Bill, the hair. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Sam. I'm here from Columbus. Um, even at my advanced years of comic book reading, who the heck is Fritzy Ritz? Did did she did that strip start and maybe get Nancy from that? Or I'm I have questions. <laughs> No, he, um, Ernie took over Fritzy Ritz. Uh, when, what, I guess it was the late 20s? 25. 25. 25. Fritzy Ritz, Ritz started in 22. Uh, Ernie took it over in 25. Yeah. And in the yeah. early days, she was out in Hollywood trying to, be a, uh, trying to be a movie star. And then she moved to some nondescript town where it seemed to be anywhere USA except it did seem to have a beach. So she'd get, her, get in a bathing suit. <laughs> and then they, um, they decided, I, I don't know who decided, whether the syndicate uh, talked to him or he himself decided to bring in a kid. And first was, uh, Fritzy Ritz had a, a nephew, Willie, and he was sort of a precursor to Nancy. And he came about six months before Nancy started, which was 32? 33. 33, yeah, yeah. And um, so Nancy came along to 33 in the daily script and then appeared just sporadically. You know, maybe once or twice a week, uh, and then became more popular and uh, showed her face in the Sunday strip later in, in 33, October or November. And uh, slowly by slowly she, she took over the strip. It seems she got more fan mail than Fritzy Ritz uh, did, and it was easier to make interesting gags that were going to appeal to the audience using a kid rather than uh, using a, the, a grown woman. So Nancy took over the strip and eventually there were, at one point, there were two strips, Nancy and Fritzy Ritz. Yeah, that continued up through the 50s. Nancy was certainly the bigger star. And the Phil Fumble Hopper. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Phil got his own piece. And there was a general trend. There were a lot of uh, sort of beautiful girl strips in, introduced in the early part of the century, maybe even after uh, uh, the famous uh, did all uh, the Gibson guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but all of those girl strips popularity was waning in the thirties mm -hmm. as uh, America's uh, sensibilities changed. And the depression and glamour girls were they weren't real like uh, or they weren't the fantasy that the twenties uh, right right yeah the blondie was a flapper oh yeah and the gold digger yeah she said <laughs> and, and uh, Polly and her pals I mean Polly was and Winnie Winkle, again, the kids took over the strip. Yeah. Winnie Winkle was a, a, a working woman, and uh, the, the kids in the strip took over. And that's a whole book that's uh, available for uh, doing somebody. <laughs> <laughs> the kids take over. <laughs> the kids are all right. Over here. Uh, 
Um, I, so, in the early Sluggo had an accent, you know, Woink was it work? Woink? Um, kind of wanted to know, you know, why was that going away with? Was it maybe not a bestseller, not very popular? Any reason that you guys might know? Was it done away with? It, it wasn't as prominent, but in the 30s and 40s, it was always in the movies. There was always the guy from the Brooklyn and the Bronx who, um, who had that kind of accent. So people were familiar with it from the movies and from radio. And I think as you got into the 60s, it just wasn't as uh, as popular or as recognizable everywhere. And it didn't you didn't associate that with the characters. You always associated with a rough and tumble, you know, lower end character, that accent. Sweet Peter, skip school a lot. Yeah. Uh, perfect image. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Mike. I drove up from the University of Cincinnati, so not a long jaunt. And a uh, gold star to the gentleman who stole my Joe Bringer question <laughs> <laughs> on that wavelength. Um, I am super proud, so I teach a comic and graphic novels course there. I am super proud to be able to help indoctrinate a new generation into loving Nancy. Uh, I wanted to have it on the reading list ever since I started teaching the class, and I finally put it on this spring, alongside Trots and Bonnie. So a lot of cognitive dissonance that we know they pair together greatly. And I'm just happy to say, you know, it was so wonderful for me to work through it, but to see young students and to see how much both the clarity and the, the, the sharpness, the conceptual nature of Bushmiller speaks to the uh, to the students, and how much they really like the Olivia James as well, which I was really proud to teach. Um, found a way to take all of the elements that work so successfully and really update them so that younger readers can not only love it in and of itself, but use it as a gateway to get back to uh, the original, the classic. So thank you all uh, for organizing this. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. And thank you for helping to make it easier to teach Nancy as part of uh, the curriculum. I think we only have time for one more. So um, sorry, everybody else. Uh, go ahead. Sorry to be last. Uh, my name is Tom. I spent, uh, I worked about 45 years in the newspaper business. And in a couple of big newspapers, I was in charge of the comics. And that was like being the uh, Black Knight in uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> <laughs> Your limbs are being cut off. <laughs> it's just a flesh wound. You know? uh, you're under constant pressure to uh, shrink the size of the comics, to get rid of them, and all that. It's, it was, it was kind of terrible. But the uh, interesting thing was people figured that comics are for kids. And you find out when you're running them that, in fact, the, the biggest audience is, is adults. And that's primarily who, who reads it. You know, the, the grandmother cutting out the family circus and pasting it on the refrigerator, the Franklin Folger characters who were around, those are the big audience. But what was wonderful about Nancy was that it did bring in kids. The kids appreciated it. And people never aged out of Nancy, you know, the, the fans of it stuck with it all along. In fact, it even became more intense. And that was one of the great things uh, about it for me. I got into uh, Nancy personally because I went to, uh, you talk about live action, I went to elementary school with a girl who was a dead ringer for Nancy. <laughs> she was, that's unbelievable. I had a terrible crush on her. Her name was Buzzy. <laughs> but that's, she, I, I don't know what happened to her. <laughs> Thank you. 